Welcome to portal season, baby. You are locked on UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the only podcast on UConn that is undefeated since its inception. Started March 3rd, 12, my own 12-0 and 0 personal win streak. We're going to keep that going through the offseason. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wage for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions may apply. Well, roster construction through the transfer portal has begun all over college basketball. Portal season is upon us, and we all have our guys, everybody on X, everybody on social media, Facebook, articles, all kinds of things, text messages, group chats. Who is UConn going to bring in? Who is your favorite team going to bring in for transfer portal season? And we all have our guys, right? There's lists on rivals. There's lists on 24-7, on three. We all have our sleepers to target, potential stars that can make a total roster rebuild coming off back-to-back titles, make us a contender for a three-peat. And I'm here to tell you, go wild with your theories because nobody can tell you how to fan. If part of being a fan now in college basketball is this NFL draft style, free agency style, transfer portal season, go with it. It's, It's a lot of fun. It reminds me a little bit of fantasy football. It reminds me a little bit of free agency in any sport of, you know, what it would what would it look like if such and such player came to your team? And in this case, obviously, UConn. Um, I'm not going to shoot down any scenarios because the truth is Dan Hurley, Kamani Young, Luke Murray, Tom Moore, they know what type of kids they want to come to UConn. And this portal, it, it the rest is speculation. And that's okay. Speculate all you want, but let's dive into it. Recruiting or transfer portal kids, I'd imagine from what we know about Dan Hurley and his staff, what do you think that first question is when we're talking about a specific kid? What's his parents like? That's got to be the first question. Because at this point, if you're on UConn's radar, you're a good player. You can play at this level. You can play at, you can play at the highest level of college basketball. Because Dan Hurley has said in interviews, parents tell on themselves. If players' parents are pains in the asses, if they're constantly complaining about how it's the coach's fault, it's the program that didn't put him in the right position, et cetera, et cetera, those type of players ruin teams. And while I haven't been on coaching staffs, I've been around different coaching staffs at the mid-major level, and I have one, I have one story that's kind of like a cautionary tale. There was a transfer that came into a, a, a team that I was covering here and look the kid was a great player phenomenal shooter um you know all the stories uh this kid dropped 50 in a game in high school he's a high volume shooter blah blah blah. it's going to transform the the team the locker room well that kid was off the team I think before even conference play started because he had the mentality of, I'm the transfer. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to remake this team into my image, not the other way around. As Dan Hurley has said, no matter how good a player is, when they come in, they have to you know, fit a role. What have other coaches said about said player? Is Are they open to playing a role? Well, let's read between the tea leaves of, of, of the things that he's already said in interviews, in conversations throughout his in his term here at UConn. These are quotes. Our approach is a little bit different on visits. There's a lot of characteristics that we're looking for that we want to make sure that people have for us because we've got the best product in college basketball right now. So as much as we need to recruit people right now, we're also vetting out what our program was. So let's think about, let's think about those words. You just won back-to-back national championships. And you're concerned because right now the product is so good. We are in a position right now to do something historic, even beyond back-to-back, to to contend for a three-peat. So 
you don't want to get those wide eyes and say, well, we need said player. We really don't need, we need people to want to come to UConn. So there's a, there's a great old adage. You don't ever shop hungry, right? How many of you have gone to the grocery store and been like, listen, I'm starving. And then you buy about 14 things that you don't need. Probably things that are terrible for you. If you go to the grocery store and you shop strategically and it's within your budget and it's within your needs as an individual or as a family, you get exactly what you need and you're good for the week, whatever. That analogy holds true here. You don't need XYZ player because of how flashy they are. They were a former five-star recruit. You need guys who are going to fill a role and want to be at UConn. Let me, let me tell you guys a, a secret here. I don't think Dan Hurley and his staff are saying, here's $100,000 to just come to UConn. I don't think that's part of their NIL, NIL collective. And I don't think that's part of what they're doing. But I know other teams are. One of my big sleepers that I thought would be a great transfer for UConn got that from Ole Miss, Mikel Brown-Jones. $100,000 just to come. He's going to be fine. He's going to be great in the SEC. Happy for him. Get your bag. But if you want to come to UConn and get exposure, that's I just don't think that's part of their process. They're not saying here's five hundred thousand dollars to you know Big Z from Kentucky, who's probably going to go to Arkansas. You know these these aren't these aren't part of their of of what what UConn is about. So listen, uh, I think what Dan Hurley is trying to do is figure out who's staying and who's going. So let's let's dive into it. Let's take a look at the current roster. Um, some of his some of his uh, comments earlier this week after the parade, you know, they this is this is a, a quote from Dan Hurley. We clearly have all the resources in place. We'll continue to do that at UConn, but we've got to make sure that it's a two way street. I think a lot of schools miss on that, and that is so key. They look at just production and numbers and talent. You're not putting together an all star team. You're putting together a team that's got to be able to function. So, who's on our team right now? Currently standing, Steph Castle. I look at his probability at leaving at 90%. And this is a quote from Steph. Whether I leave, I could make I could make it better for my family. If I stay, I can still be coached by the best coaches in college basketball. The decision really isn't tough. It's just really it's just about making the right one. And then Dan said, so some of it's in his control, some of it's out of his control. Uh, and they'll meet early early this week. Castle is a projected top 10 pick. I think number eight overall by USA Today's mock draft, number five by Bleacher Report. So I think before the tournament, he was a top 15 pick and, you know, things have changed a little bit. I think he's obviously upped his stock uh, after winning that title and being and playing a major role. I think there's a James Booknight um, cautionary tale here where I think Steph's situation is a little different, obviously. Um, we all know how great his parents are and not to say James's parents aren't. Um, just as far as preparedness, you know, I think that there's a maturity to Steph that is different. Um, and I think it was pretty consensus that he's a lottery pick and what that looks like. So, you know, some of that is not in, in Steph's control. I don't think you want to say to him, stay an extra year because then that kind of muddies the waters for guys like Ahmad. I mean, uh, but it'd be a nice problem to have if he does want to stay for an extra, extra year. Let's flip it to Alex Caravan. 50-50, I think. He's definitely been weighing on it. He's 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 even said some days I'm leaning towards one way, other days I'm moving the other way. So he's torn and he's trying to figure out. The good news is, is if he stays, he can graduate in three years. Um, but he also has an opportunity to potentially be a, an NBA player. Um, and this is Hurley's quote. I'm going to paraphrase this. If you're not going to be a consensus clear cut first round pick, I think we I think you stay in college. Second round, it's a tough spot. Up through those mid thirties, there's no guaranteed contracts. I think it's better to be in college than it is on a two way contract. That's that's his opinion. And then lastly, the other big one is Hassan Diara. I think that's fifty fifty. Hassan is still giving it some thought, just having conversations. Um, you know, from everything that you hear, he feels like it's been an amazing experience that he's he's a part of at the UConn program. But the de decision really will likely come down to his role. Right? Is he going to come in and be okay with being a, a six man again because what he envisions for himself next year in terms of his role has got to be aligned with what Hurley and the staff has because you know players didn't align with what they viewed in the past they've they've brought in appropriate players in both years and they've won back-to-back -back championships so 
I think there's just is going to be a moment where they're going to come down and actually, you know, talk about it, be truthful um, and see it's really try to. And this is a quote from Hurley. We're just going to try to tell the truth with players about where we see them. But what we would like to return as many of the champions, many champions as possible. So I, I love that. He wants to bring back players that uh, that matter to him. Well, one thing is for certain, UConn had a transfer visit over the weekend in Terrace Reed Jr. We'll talk to Brock League about Terrace and what is what is potentially to expect from his game if and when he comes to the Huskies after this. When you're hiring for small business, you want to find quality professionals who are right for the role. That's why you have to check on LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn has the, all the tools to help find the right professionals for your team, faster and free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect one. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. 86% of small businesses get qualified candidates within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Brock, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, really appreciate you jumping on. Um, you've covered this Michigan basketball and football team for a couple of years now. My comp for Terrace Reed Jr., and this will warm the hearts of UConn fans, is a more athletic Adama Sinogo. What are your thoughts? Do you th agree with that? Is there a little more wiggle to his game? Um, just in what I've watched, it looks like he's got so he was a top 30, 30 recruit before he went to Michigan. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good comp. Um, you know, I, I do think the one thing about Reed's game that he would need to improve on to to ultimately reach that level would be just to improve his consistency. There were a lot of times throughout his two years at Michigan where he just really wasn't consistent. And, you know, one, one offensive possession, he'd, he'd get the ball in the low post and then hit the defender with a jab step and, and you know, turn and get to the bucket and score. And then the very next offensive possession, it seemed like he would fumble an entry pass into the post and he'd trickle out of bounds or he'd turn it over and, I, I just think he's got to be a little more consistent um, in order to play at a place like UConn. Obviously, it's not official yet, and he was just on a visit there, but uh, just got to be more consistent because obviously UConn has the, the best standards in college basketball, back-to-back -back national champs. So I would say overall, it's a good comp, uh, but Reed, I think we need to improve his consistency a little bit. Yeah, do you, and you mentioned the standard that UConn's created. Do you think he could come in? I, I started the show talking about when transfers come to UConn, they have to fit a role. It's got to be a mutual. It's got to be mutually beneficial for both sides. And obviously, that's the, I think that's the same most places, but it's, I think it's a little elevated at UConn because they're not saying to. And I, maybe I'm wrong on this, but uh, from what I've heard, they're not just saying, "All right, Terrace, if you come, here's a hundred thousand dollars just just to come." That's not a part of what they're envisioning with NIL. So it's it's not just someone throwing a bag at you and kind of like figuring it out as we go. It's got to does does he fit that profile of kind of a lunch pail kid that's going to want to come in and work hard and also kind of find that consistency, find that role within Yukon system. I think he could. Uh he he definitely didn't find his role at Michigan. Uh a lot of people were high on him coming out of high school like you said top 30 recruit but you know, his freshman year, he was playing behind Hunter Dickinson, who was an All-American, and he really didn't see the floor a lot. 12.6 uh, minutes per game I have written here as a freshman. And then as a sophomore, he he takes that leap into the starting role. Um, but Michigan as a team just never really got going. So I, I think it's hard. He's one of the hard, the toughest players I've ever had to to gauge and judge uh, in the in the transfer portal because he's got the talent. It's clear that he has talent, but I don't think Jawan Howard and Michigan did a great job of bringing that out of him. And so if he goes to a place like UConn, you could see Dan Hurley really begin to develop that talent that Reed has and ultimately help the team. But to your point, Cam Spencer was, I think, the greatest example of that last year for UConn where it was just a clear fit. Like he he and Dan Hurley fit like a glove, right? You can You could mm -hmm. see it as the two were celebrating after the or at the end of the national championship game they're on the court they're 
really, really excited and, and chest, chest bumping. bumping. And yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's tough to, to know if Reed's going to be a guy like that just because Michigan never really had success while he was there. But I do think he's got to rejuvenate his career, right? And he's, he's essentially, I don't want to say wasted two years of college, but it, it, I don't think this is what he envisioned for his first two years of school. So we'll have to see, uh, obviously, if he does end up choosing UConn, what, what that looks like for, for him and the Huskies. Yeah. Was Jawan Howard getting fired kind of the impetus of him uh, uh, transferring? Was it was Or was he probably thinking about if Jawan stays, if they give him one more year, do you think he transfers anyway? I, I think he transfers anyway. I, I just think Michigan was in too rough of a spot. Um, I even think, to be honest, I think if Jawan would have stayed, that would have uh, – Reed would have been even more inclined to enter the transfer portal. Um just my t- just my take on it, but yeah, it, it it just never worked out. I don't know, you know. Juwan brought in Hunter Dickinson, and his whole pitch was, you know, I was I was a great player when I was here back in the '90s, and I can help you become the same and really develop you as a big man. And I think Terrace Reed saw that and and Dickinson's success and everything, and that persuaded him to end up going to Michigan. But like I said, it, it just never worked out. Michigan's Michigan's system was was really really bad and and they had a lot of tough injuries this past season so i i do think he was portal bound either way and i think you could kind of see it as the season was going on and michigan kept losing and losing and losing no it makes sense let's get back into terrace and his game is is he more um you would know more than i just in watching highlights you know good so it looks like he has some good post-up moves you know obviously talk about his consistency needs to improve can he get out in transition? You think, you know, the way the the Yukon bigs, whether even Klingon was was out working some guys who are smaller and fat and it's probably faster than him. And then you have Sanson Johnson, who's probably a similar type player to Terrace Reed Jr., just in terms of his athletic ability. Um, can can he be that type of player, you know, maybe in between that? Obviously, he's bigger than Samson. He's not as big as Donovan. He's a yeah. little bit, he's you know what I mean? He's kind of in the middle of be, between Samson Johnson and Donovan Klingon as far as size. Yeah. He can, he, and he did it a little bit at Michigan. Uh, again, consistency needs to be there. There were some times where he'd get out and run, and, and you know, a point guard would give him the ball, and he'd get a transition dunk. And then there were other times, again, like I said, he'd, he'd fumble the ball. That might be my biggest critique of Terrace Reed as, as a player: is his hands. He he hmm. really seems to struggle catching the ball, holding onto the ball, uh, knowing what to do when he has the ball. So, you know, we'll have to we'll have to see what happens there but um he, he can get he can get out in transition he did it at michigan but but like i said it was just i think a, a factor of coaching and and consistency there that it just it just really wasn't working together i wonder you mentioned his hands that's such an interesting point so let's stay on that for a second i don't know if you've seen any of this stuff from yukon we had michael cohen on who wrote an article about um yukon's offense right and how they built this offensive juggernaut with different sets and one of the things that he brought to our attention as UConn fans is every player before every practice gets receiver gloves and they wear them and they also, and that's how they work on kind of their whole point of like stickiness and like the, uh, the, uh, the ability to dribble handoff, the ability to possess the ball and also maybe take a couple of dribbles as a big. So you're not, he's no one's going to ask Terrace Reed Jr. to run the point, but what they're asking their bigs to do at UConn is different than, a lot of different it, – it's it, it looks very European basketball. It looks very NBA basketball-like where they're they're out of, you know, free throw line extended and they're using their body as a, as a screener. So I wonder if that's a that's an intrigue for Dan Hurley and his staff to say, this kid really hasn't had the technique that – but he has the ability but doesn't have the – didn't have the technique shown to him about what he can do. Because I would imagine when you watch him play, I, I see what you mean, but – Samson Johnson, I don't think anyone would consider him to have the greatest hands in the world, but I think that's it's gotten better as time has gone on, right? So I think yeah. they probably look at him as that. Um, I don't even want to say because Samson has been great for us, but like a, a more offensive, accomplished Samson Johnson, and then see if we can kind of get him into our mold. What do, what do you think about that? I think I think that would be a fantastic drill for Reed to to go through and obviously like you said it may not be like a quick turnaround for 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 Samson Johnson for Samson Johnson and it's improved over time. I think it could be I think it could be the same for Reed in the sense where 
he comes in maybe the first few games of the season, he's really not where you think he might be after a few months of, of being in the system there. But as the season goes on and as, as he meshes together with the team, it could you could see a lot of improvement. And I think we saw that quite a bit with UConn as a team, how they just meshed together last year as the season went on and ultimately into the NCAA tournament. So I think that'd be a great drill for Reed because, like I said, that would be my biggest critique of his game is just his hands being consistent with catching the ball, making a move, and, and and not turning the ball over. So, I mean, that'd be that'd be really really good for for Reed in terms of of technique and drill. Last question on Terrace Reed. What about his defensive ability? Is he more of a um, defender in the terms of shot blocking ability, defensive rebounding, things of that nature? But that UConn, UConn fans are used to guys who can come in and play defense. Hopefully not foul, but that's also up to the the uh, the officials that evening. Um, what 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 are your what are your comps for him, or what are your thoughts on him on defense? Yeah, he's six ten, about two sixty. Uh, so, like you said, kind of between uh, was it Samson Johnson and, and Donovan Klingon? Um, yep. So, you know, he he's a he's a solid defender. I'd say he's he's really nothing special. But again, like I said, it, it's probably a matter of of coaching at Michigan that was that was really hurting him in that area. But he he can he can block shots. I don't have uh, pulled up exactly how many shots he blocked last year per game, but he he pulled in seven point two rebounds. I don't know how that compares to a guy like Klingon. Uh, I'd assume it's probably about the same. A, uh, about the same. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Um, he, he's a he's a good defender. I'd say he, he's not bad. He he is bad at times. I will say that there are times where he'll just have a defensive lapse and let a guy buy him or or just totally blank on a defensive possession, but. He can defend and he can block shots. He blocked quite a few last year that I remember off the top of my head. So, um, again, like I said, like I've said many times already, it was probably coaching at Michigan that really didn't help him out in that regard. Dan Hurley, obviously the greatest coach in, in college basketball at this current point in time. I'm sure with a guy like the, with a guy like Reed, who's 6'10", 260, he would have no problem helping him out defensively and turning him into an elite shot blocker. Well, from your uh, lips to God's ears, Brock, we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on to our portal combat segment. But before we do, this is a very uh, transfer portal season is very similar to free agency in NFL or mock draft, and it's locked on NFL's mock draft live April seventeenth seven seven a.m. streaming on Locked On Sports today twenty four seven streaming on YouTube or on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six episode series April seventeenth seven. Uh, p.m eastern to hear who the local locked on experts are picking for every nfl franchise with live reactions lo lo local college football experts and even their fantasy football angle locked on nfl mock draft april 17th seven o'clock streaming live on locked on sports today 24 7 streaming on youtube or the free amazon fire tv channel apps we are going to talk about brock to talk to brock about who he prefers in this episode of transfer portal combat after this It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet on automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, Brock. I did this with. I'm going to do this with everybody that comes on for transfer portal, transfer portal combat. We've seen Maxine Reynard took his name out of the transfer portal. He's back at Stanford. One of my biggest sleepers, UNCG's Mikel Brown Jones, just got himself a nice payday and went to Old Miss. He got himself a little bag there, but I think he's going to be fantastic in the SEC. I'm going to give you two names. You give me who you think wins portal combat and maybe why, and then I'll tell you. If I agree or if I disagree, um, right. first one, first one, John L. Davis. You'll, you're probably familiar with him with your new coach, uh, Dusty May. He's a, an FAU guy. I wonder if he maybe is going to Michigan. Is there, <laughs> maybe you can break some news. Or Roddy Gale Jr. Those are our two shooting guards, potentially probably more like combo guards. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, these are two guys that are actually pretty interested in Michigan. So I'm 
quite All familiar right. with, with, with both of them. Uh, Roddy Gale coming from Ohio State. I got to go with John L. Davis, though. Um, I've watched a little bit of Roddy Gale at Ohio State just, just through watching watching the Big Ten. But may, maybe it's a little bit biased, too, because like you said, Dusty May a, a few weeks now on the job at Michigan. And, and obviously, John L. Davis is probably the number one target for Michigan. He's still got to go through uh, the NBA draft process and things like that. But early signs are he will probably be returning to school. And I I really love his game. So uh, I, I would I would take John L. Davis over Roddy Gale Jr. I'm going to differ from you. And this is this is more of a UConn angle, because if I, if he was if Roddy Gale Jr. was interested in UConn, um, he's a Niagara Falls, New York kid. So, hey, Roddy, if you're interested in UConn, head, head on over here. We, we wouldn't mind to see you. He's a 42 percent three point shooter. I think um, that fits well with UConn system. General Davis. Trust me, um, people have been asking me all the time, like, why, why wouldn't you want General Davis? I think he, I think he's a great player, and I think he would he wouldn't fit at UConn for the reason of he's got to be able to shoot threes, and he's just not that guy. He's more he is he is the quintessential like old school mid range jumper, fin- great at the free throw line, can get you 20, 30, 20 to thirty points in a blink, but he just I just don't think he would fit in UConn system. So for me, if I'm if I'm going from the UConn prism, I'm going Roddy Gale Jr. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. I, I, you know, it's 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 tough when you have a guy who can shoot shoot the lights out like Roddy Gale and then John L. Davis, like you said, more mid range. So, yeah, probably it's interesting how it fits better for UConn for for Roddy Gale Jr. But probably fits better for Michigan and Dusty May uh, for for John for L. sure. Davis. And he's familiar with him, and I think he's going to do great there. I would imagine he probably will go to 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 um to Michigan and honestly if if Dan Hurley didn't exist if you if in a world where Dan Hurley doesn't exist I think Dusty May is a fantastic coach and you guys are going to be in a good spot there um all right next on the list this is a a former Duke player and a Tennessee player we got Mark Mitchell and Jonas Adu who you got yeah uh to be completely honest I haven't watched a ton of either player but uh I do know that Mark Mitchell was very highly recruited coming out of high school uh and I looked at both of their numbers early this morning, just trying to get a gauge on who you know had the edge in, in what certain areas. But their numbers are pretty similar, and so just mm-hmm. I'll go simply because of uh, high school ranking, which I know normally doesn't doesn't matter at this point in in basketball careers anymore. Simply because of high school ranking, I'll go with Mark Mitchell Jr. or Mark Mitchell. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think this is a toss up. I, I you're, that's a, and I think you're you're. I wouldn't argue with you two vehemently on that it's i think it really would matter of like if we're both coaches who who do we want more right do you want a, a back to the basket jonas adu who can kind of step out and shoot threes i think he made like 15 on the year when he was wide open mark mitchell should never shoot a three he's got one of the <laughs> worst he literally has one of the worst uh shot uh shots i've ever seen like just in terms of like his form um, he looks like he's using a shot put. So, but he's also like an energy guy. Like if, if Mark Mitchell, if you want, if, if you could, if a coach could uh, get him, like if Dan Hurley got a hold of him and said, Mark Mitchell, here's what I want you to do. Guard their best perimeter perimeter wing or hound, you know, a Zach Eady or somebody like that and just get a bunch of rebounds and don't shoot. He'd be perfect. But if he, if, but if he gets in his head where he's just like, he's got a score. Yeah. Now we're talking, I'm taking Jonas Adu. So that's a toss up. I don't even have. I, I think you can't go can't go wrong either way. They're both very similar, but different styles, right? Not going to be an offensive threat, defensive guys. Um, but yeah, that's, that was an interesting one because Jonas is like a, a you know a, a beanstalk, and in in Mark Mitchell's more stout. So that's yeah. an interesting uh, comp there. Um, all right, this one we'll do one more. Brandon Garrison or Danny Wolf? Danny Wolf is the Yale mm-hmm. center that everyone at UConn is asking me about. What about Danny Wolf? So um, if you had to pick between Brandon Garrison and Danny Wolf, what are your thoughts? I got to go with Danny Wolf just because there's been a lot of smoke uh, with him in Michigan, too. And I, I do believe he's in uh, with North Carolina, too. I think he took a visit there either this this past weekend or this upcoming weekend. I can't remember which, but uh, really, really, really like his game. And, and Dusty May, is, I know, has reached out to him for Michigan. and and um, I'm offered him a spot, I'm assuming, and and he's just got to, you know, decide whether it's going to be Michigan or North Carolina. I think those are the two main schools that are in contention for him at this point, if I remember correctly. So, uh, but yeah, really like his game out of Yale and and Michigan has a 
long history of taking guys from the Ivy League too. So mm-hmm. I think it'd be a good fit for Michigan. Obviously, I don't know about UConn, but uh, I would I would go with Wolf. Yeah, I I, I would too. Uh, just based off again like style, uh, Brandon Garrison is a freak athlete. I think he would fit almost anywhere. You know, if he, you know Oklahoma State doesn't doesn't bring in guys who are kind of like iffy on the athletic scale. Danny Wolf, my only concern with him, whether he plays at Carolina or Michigan, or even if he was to, you know, te- you know, you know, take a take a sniff at UConn, which I don't think they're looking at him right now, um, is athleticism. Is is he going to get bullied uh, by big power forwards and centers? Now, if he's if he's strictly going to be the, you know, the 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 stretch four, stretch five on a team, and you know, 10, 15 minutes a game, I think it's fantastic. And if you can sell him on that role. At either of those schools, Michigan or North Carolina, then you got yourself quite a bit of you know player, you know eight to ten points a game potentially off the bench. Uh, you know I don't wouldn't expect a ton of rebounds from him, but I think that's that's kind of the role that you're gonna you're gonna have for for a kid like Danny Wolf. Um, well, listen, man, I, I really appreciate you stay with me as I as I end the show here. But um, thanks for playing Portal Combat and talking to us about Terrace Reed Jr. Hopefully, we get a commit from him and uh, we'll have that connection to UConn, Michigan throughout the rest of the year um yeah. lot locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on youtube and now it's also available on amazon fire tv and the free fire tv channels app. locked on sports today is here for you 24 7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of locked on plus our national shows covering every league find locked on sports today now available on the free fire tv channels app before we go brock tell people where they can find you that we have your social media tag there but if they want to look at your stuff but you know i'm sure there's listen there's Michigan football fans everywhere, even in Connecticut uh, and wherever we go. So if, if you want to, you know, give yourself a shout out here, please, please do so. Yeah, uh, my Twitter's there at the bottom below my name on the screen. Uh, I do I do I cover Michigan football and basketball for the Rivals Network, uh, michigan.rivals.com. You can find us there. Uh, full coverage of Dusty May and and obviously Sharon Moore taking over for Jim Harbaugh. It's exciting times at Michigan. So, yeah, Michigan, michigan.rivals.com. You can find everything uh, that we cover for Michigan there. All right. Well, this is another episode of Locked on UConn, asking you guys to stay locked in, stay connected, make sure your toughness meter meter is always rising. And as always, go Huskies.